Chapter Seven of the Master Mystery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Master Mystery by John W. Gray and Arthur B. Reeve. Chapter Seven. After her brief encounter with Balcom in the hallway, Zita stealthily mounted to Flint's room. Flint's condition was unchanged. He lay sprawled out in a huge armchair, his head swaying from side to side, as he muttered and mumbled incoherently, while his leering smile caused even Zita to shudder. She was, however, alive to the importance of her mission. Stealing herself, she raised Flint from the chair and steadied him with one hand, while she tried to smooth out the wrinkles of his clothing so that his mad condition would not be too apparent when they went outdoors. It was a hard task, but Zita soon accomplished it, and, half supporting, she led him through a door on the farther side of the room. They crept down a back stairway and so away from the house. At times Flint stumbled and almost fell, and once that insane laugh startled a passerby who started after them, then changed his mind and proceeded on his way. It was then that Zita's heart almost stopped beating. She realized that the situation would be unexplainable to a stranger, and she urged the insane Flint on faster. Renewed hope came to her with each step. She had almost relaxed her precautions when, suddenly, from a clump of bushes, several men leaped out. They seized Flint, who merely started babbling afresh. Zita, ignorant of what was really happening, struck out right and left in the hopeless encounter until one of the men with a grin seized her wrist in his powerful grasp and twisted it until she screamed with pain. Then she realized for the first time that she had fallen into the hands of the emissaries of the automaton. Had Balcom planned it, or had that mechanical monster taken advantage of what Balcom had ordered? In the meantime, the other thugs, with Flint between them, made off hurriedly. With a last push that almost threw Zita to the ground, the last of them dashed into the shrubbery, and for several moments Zita dazedly stood there as he crashed through the underbrush, making good the escape and capture. Then she turned and ran back to Brent Rock. Locke, in the meantime, had arrived at the laboratory of his old friend Hadwell, the chemist, where he was warmly welcomed. It was the usual dusty workshop of one devoted to one idea, science, with no touches of comfort. Hadwell fairly lived amid retorts, Bunsen burners, and regents. He was a man of profound research rather than the commercial chemist, and it was from him that Locke, in earlier days, had learned many lessons so well that now his career was watched with interest by many distinguished men of science. Hadwell was delighted at the chance to examine the strange scrapings of wax which Locke had dug out of the sockets of the candlestick, the more so as they must contain some mysterious poison. First he studied them under a powerful lens, then by chemical reactions, until he made visible some peculiar crystals. Locke himself was amazed as his friend worked. "'You don't know it all yet, my boy.' smiled the aged professor. There's still something the old teacher can add to your education, and I'm glad, Quentin, very glad, for it'll draw you closer to me again. I need you to carry on my work when I must lay it down. I'm not positive, he continued, but I believe these crystals to be those of Datura Stramonium, and, as you say speeds the thing, We'll begin by noting the effect of the stuff as a gas on that guinea pig over there. "'Have you masks?' asked Locke, with true scientific caution. "'Yes, on the shelf. You're keen, Quentin. These fumes can penetrate the tiniest aperture, and, if my guess is right, without a mask, you would quickly laugh yourself to death.' "'Don't, Professor, don't joke.' for there is no joy in that mad laughter. It is horrible, maddening, even to the hearer. Let us get to work. The father of the girl I love may even now be sinking to his death. 
We must determine the nature of this deadly stuff, and then find an antidote. The chemist brought out the cage in which the guinea pig was placidly munching a lettuce leaf, and placed it in a convenient spot on the table. Then, after Locke, as well as the professor, had carefully adjusted the masks, the latter lighted a Bunsen burner and applied the flame to the deadly crystals. A pungent fume was given off and collected in a rubber bag, or cone, from which a long tube protruded. This tube the chemist introduced into the cage. For a moment there was no perceptible change in the animal's actions. Then it stopped eating, sniffed at the strange odor, and commenced to twitch violently. This twitching continued for several minutes when the creature started to revolve in circles, like a Japanese dancing mouse. Finally it became subject to spasms, and although the professor withdrew the tube, these symptoms continued. "'I was right,' he cried. "'It is an especially poisonous variety of that almost unknown oriental drug, Datura stramonium. I think I can find an antidote to it also. To work, my boy, to work!' One experiment after another resulted in failure, however, and it was while they were so engaged that the telephone rang and a feminine voice inquired for Locke. It was an excited Ava who called. "'Quentin!' she burst forth, breathlessly. "'What do you think has happened? The strangest thing! Flint has escaped! Tell me what to do. Can't you come to me at once? I need you!' Locke needed no further urging. Important though the work of finding the antidote was, Ava's call was more imperative to him. He reassured her as best he could over the wire, for he had no idea what had really happened. Zita, as might have been expected, on her return to Brent Rock had been far too clever to disclose the exact truth that Flint had been abducted, and that while in her own charge. When she arrived at Brent Rock, she had mounted by the same stairway by which she and Flint had departed. Entering Flint's room, she had raised the alarm and had acted her part so well that Ava thought that she had discovered Flint's absence at the precise moment at which Zita had cried out, and she had come running in answer to her call. Locke gave Hadwell a brief outline of what had just occurred at Brent Rock. "'Professor,' he pleaded, "'for heaven's sake, don't fail me. Try as you never tried before to find the antidote for this strange combination of poisons. Telephone me when you have it.' Locke seized his hat and Hadwell redoubled his efforts to fathom the toxic secret. At Brent Rock, in the meantime, everything was in confusion. Ava was almost distracted, and, to add to her discomfort, Paul took occasion to call. In the past few days, her distrust of him, for she could call it by no other name, had grown, and the furtive glances which he exchanged with Zita, little troublemaker, were not reassuring. But when Ava's maid, motioning her aside, told her that she had been a witness to the departure of Zita and Flint, Ava's suspicions from a vague misgiving became a stern reality. She longed for Locke's return and protection from the very man to whom she was engaged. As Locke left the chemist, he noticed a light runabout across the street, half hidden in the shadows but he failed to notice the evil face of Deluxe Dora peering at him from beneath the rim of a well-pulled-down hat. "'Huh!' she muttered. "'We'll get his number, and here's where I go after it.' Locke hailed a passing taxicab, gave a hurried direction to the chauffeur, and jumped in. The taxi snorted, cut out open, and jumped forward as the driver clumsily shifted the worn gears but out of the shadows there glided a low-hung runabout with a purling motor that without effort kept Locke's taxi just in sight without seeming to be following. At the time that the emissaries abducted Flint, he had been roughly handled and some of his clothing had been torn. But as he had been incapable of the slightest degree of real self-defense, 
The thugs had soon desisted beating him up, with the result that he had escaped bodily injury except for a few slight scratches. The emissaries of the automaton led him by devious winding paths down to the shore, and, half walking, half running, pressing close to the high cliffs, they urged him forward. Soon they came to a cleft in the rock, and with one hand using a well-hooded electric torch to light the way, they dragged the poor unfortunate into the cave entrance to the den. This cave was a marvel of nature, hewn out of the solid rock by countless tides, its dome lost in the darkness. It gave an impression of immensity, while in many directions passageways gave off from what might be called a main chamber. Flint was roughly thrown on a rock, where, head in hands, he swayed backward and forward, now moaning, now chuckling, now laughing outright. The echo of that laugh resounded hollowly in the dismal place and must have notified the supreme master of this underground world that his domain had been invaded. A metallic clanging in the distance, as of struck anvils, a crunching as the smaller rocks broke in twain under the enormous weight of the iron monster, then far, far down the passageway, two points of fire, the eyes of the thing, and with arms swinging like flails, from out the passageway there stalked the automaton. Even the emissaries, slaves to this monster through fear, and seeing it often, fell back in awe and consternation, so terrible was its menace. It strode over to Flint, and, pushing him backward, glared at him with burning eyes that seemed to search his soul. The monster then turned to one of the emissaries, and, with a sweeping gesture, gave a command. The emissary understood, and immediately ran up one of the passageways, returning in a few moments with a bottle which contained a purplish mixture. At another sign from the automaton, the emissary took a drinking glass and poured out a portion of the purple fluid. Then he forced the draft between Flint's clenched teeth. A violent trembling shook Flint from head to foot, a shudder of so exhausting a nature that after the spasm Flint, weakened, reclined against the cold wall of the cave, his body in a clammy perspiration. But gradually there came a change in his dazed, mad eyes. The iris contracted and became more normal. Even the leaden hue of his face slowly passed away. The face muscles relaxed, and gradually the light of reason appeared in his eyes. In a questioning manner, Flint gazed about him. He saw the cave with its scintillating points of fire, as the man with the torch gesticulated. He saw the emissaries, and the realization that his position was perilous came to him. But it was only when he saw the towering form of the automaton that his blood froze with horror, and he made a frantic effort to escape the very thing which he had feared existed in Madagascar, and had attempted to betray to Brent on the fatal night. It was useless. He was soon borne down by the thugs, who stationed two of their number to guard him. Seeing the utter hopelessness of any attempt to escape, Flint sat quietly while his crafty mind schemed for some other plan. Suddenly he saw the bottle, the contents of which had restored his reason. Reaching out slyly, he turned it around until he could read the label, and then, even in his predicament, he exulted over his discovery. It was the antidote. Like a flash came to him a shrewd scheme to use the knowledge. An emissary who seemed to be a leader came over to him. Flint, he snarled, you get one chance, see? Beat it back to Brent Rock and see that you get that Brent girl to come to the place where we will turn you loose. Understand? If you fail, it means death. Think it over. Flint could only agree. 
They bandaged his eyes and quickly led him back over the road by which they had come. End of chapter 7 Recording by Roger Moline